everyone, and welcome to The Buck Stops Here. I am your host, Katherine Murray. Well, we do pre-tape this program, and we are taping it on Thursday, February the 24th, the day that Russia has invaded Ukraine. Obviously, a lot to talk about. We did see the market sell off to begin the day. They seem to be recouping some of those losses. We've also seen the price of WTI spike higher, hitting that $100 mark. It has also pulled back a little bit now. But obviously, a lot of uncertainty as it relates to the economic outlook globally and also, of course, here at home in Canada and also with respect to the markets. So who better to bring into this conversation and get perspective from none other than Brett Wilson. He, of course, is a Canadian investment banker, businessman, investor, philanthropist, and uh, and also apparently a former dog owner and dragon's den, as everybody knows you, Brett. Uh, welcome and thanks so much for being with us. Yeah, and it's more former dragon, current dog owner, but that's another uh, line. Uh, okay, I wasn't sure and it's, about anyway, the dog. Other, other than the war that's going on, I'm having a great day. Perfect. Yes, absolutely. Um, but let's start with that. Um, in, in terms of your your broader thoughts, and um, you know, obviously the reaction in the market that's kind of secondary. What, what do you think happens next? Well, the uncertainty still is where NATO, and in particular the United States, goes, and whether Europe decides to respond in a in a negative or adversarial way. Uh, I mean, the invasion is underway, and we've known it. I mean, to be blunt, how anyone could assume that there wasn't going to be an invasion based on the actions, conversations, the activities of the last two or three or four months. But, you know, Europe has got its own challenges in terms of how it supplies fossil fuels, as it's adversely called, or hydrocarbons, and uh, natural gas flows through the Ukraine. Um, but Europe needs desperately something other than just renewables because they're not reliables. They just aren't reliable. I mean, wind doesn't always blow. Sun doesn't always shine. And so the idea, and they're shutting down their nuclear because the, uh, call it the eco-extremists or alarmists or terrorists are, are, are fighting the, the nuclear plat proliferation that was once possible and plausible and is actually one of the great solutions to any concern someone has about emissions. But anyway, Europe has its own problems to solve. And um, I, I am desperate, terribly worried about what China, what Russia is doing with the probably the quiet support of China to the Ukraine. And it's not the Ukraine, it's Ukraine. But uh, right. it's incredibly frustrating to watch this. And I mean, Canada, you know, a joke, a joke on the national and international scene, telling the telling Russia that we're going to impose sanctions on them. I, I doubt that anyone in Russia is even aware that we care. So we're, we are irrelevant, but we got to watch and see what NATO and in particular the United States decides to do in terms of protecting interests of the U, of the folks, the Ukrainian people. But, Brett, you know, it, it, their hands are tied in some ways, some might say, given the fact that Russia supplies 40, 50 percent of, of nat gas to Europe and obviously significant to, to Germany as well. So um, to impose sanctions that Russia is going to care about um, might be quite difficult. And, and the problem, of course, with that as well is if this is allowed to go through, what kind of precedent does that set for China and Taiwan? Well, China, Taiwan, they've got to be watching. I saw an article on the news last night about how China is inevitably looking at all of the positioning that's being done, the political positioning, the social media positioning, the messaging that's being done. And uh, I think Taiwan is, uh, is very much at risk. But I also think countries adjacent to uh, the Ukraine in the grand ambition of, uh, of Putin are also at risk. And something mm -hmm. has to be done to stop this now. And uh, let's hope it doesn't escalate to bombing. Let's hope it doesn't escalate to the threat of nuclear. Um, but Putin's made it crystal clear, don't mess with me. Mm -hmm. So everyone's walking on a tightrope right now. And uh, that tightrope is sanctions. And I think as you and I would agree, the sanctions are almost laughable given the economic importance of Russia to Europe. So how, mm -hmm. how, do, you, how do you say don't do that? And then right. follow up with a slap. It, it's yeah. virtually impossible. Yeah, and um, you know, and, and we're watching the price of WTI skyrocket, which I want to get your your take on as well, because you know we've already had uh, record high inflation numbers around the world. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got the U.S. Fed next week, and also the Bank of Canada next week, apparently planning to raise rates to combat inflation. I mean, I think one of the key questions then is, um, you know, should we be worried at all about stagflation? 
Uh, Brett, we're going to take a quick break. We'll come right back. I'll get your views on that. Absolutely. And we are back with Brett Wilson. Um, Brett, I want to pick it up in terms of there are still so many uncertainties right now. We don't know what's going to play out as it relates to Russia, Ukraine sanctions. Um, but we are we do know that we are seeing WTI higher, likely holding here. We've got inflation concerns. Um, how do you see this impacting the economy? Well, uh, there's the West, and then there's the country, and then there's the globe. And the West is seeing some extraordinary an acceleration in terms of capital, repayment of debt on balance sheets, repurchase of shares, normal course issuer bids in terms of the oil companies and service companies buying shares back. And so the rewards of the element of the price of oil and the price of gas that have come back into the industry, uh, even during the second year of the, of the two year call it the COVID war, um, it's really changing things in Alberta. And I think a lot of people keep focusing on the, you know, the fact that our office towers are 30% empty. Um, well, it's almost irrelevant because those towers are generally owned by pension funds and institutions in Toronto. So it doesn't affect any of what really goes on in Calgary. And uh, I see expansion, I see hiring. We're, we're in a lot of companies, all companies I talk to are staff shortage. Uh, our staff comprise, compromised because they're having trouble getting the people who lost, we lost from the industry. So real picture, big picture is the economy in the West, call it parts of BC, all of Alberta, certainly parts of Saskatchewan is extraordinarily robust and it's just not fully reflected in how people look at what's going on here. Um, in terms of Canada, inflation's an issue and we're seeing it across Canada. And it's absolutely bizarre that the government of the day the Liberal Party would add a carbon tax to the escalating cost of hydrocarbons so that it's punitive. And yet now they're asking provincial governments to relax and put caps in place. The NDP is pushing for caps. So the NDP wants a cap on electricity, a cap on gas prices, and yet they're the first to say we need to add a carbon tax. So the hypocrisy and could just let's jump from hypocrisy, the stupidity of many of the political responses to this is bizarre. The other comment I'll make on inflation, I run several large restaurants in our portfolio of mm. investments. Our cost year over year for the same menu is up 25%, not 3%, 5%, 7%, 25% <laughs> year over year. So, and that's a story that's not really being told either, because of course they take a bread basket of items in a grocery store and then add on a little bit of, uh, interest and a little bit of you know your cost of living uh, away from food and so you might see a three to five percent increase but again 25 percent year over year and we're buying the same food it's right five percent so inflation is a is a monster that's uh, that's going to rear its head the confusion about how we respond to the cost of you know electricity of natural gas the hypocrisy and confusion, the stupidity, given that they're trying to add on an ever-increasing carbon tax to make it punitive to consume any of those products, and yet we're going to now have to figure out how to control the cost of them so that people can live. How do you run a country with that stupidity at the top? Well, I suppose you run it because you were elected in, you were voted in. And yes. so my question has been yes. for years, when, when, and I, and I think we're getting the answer, when will the Canadian consumer say enough is enough you better be running this more like a proper business where, you know, we need the revenue to offset the costs and we need to make it more favorable for, for every Canadian. I mean, that's what they say they're going to do. But yep. at, at some point, and maybe we're at that point, given inflation and the rise in costs and added taxes, that people will start to say, what is going on here? But I don't know if we're there yet, Brett, and I've been saying this for years. Well, we're easing there. But right now, let's be clear. We're run by an NDP liberal coalition. We saw that in the War Measures Act, and I call it the War Measures Act. I don't care what the new name is, but it's effectively the War Measures Act and the stupidity of introducing it, the NDP falling course and joining forces and trying to introduce it. And now it's being withdrawn because they actually don't need it. Uh, and we've spent tens and tens of millions of dollars, according to some people I know in Ottawa, 40, 50 million dollars was spent on the War Measures Act for no purpose, none 
whatsoever. So if that's what's leading and governing our country, how can we anticipate that whether it's a Mark Carney, a Jerry Butts, uh, or the goofiness of, call it the Friedland um, Trudeau um, combo, how can they run our country using the stupidity of their inability to figure out how to you know, manage inflation, manage costs, manage carbon taxes, manage the economy, and participate on a global basis. And we haven't even started to talk about participate on a global basis. But we've shut down our ability to put pipelines to our coasts. I mean, we saw the, the literally an, an assault, a warlike assault on the coastal gas site the other day. I mean, I could go on forever about how frustrating mm -hmm. that is. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We'll come back and talk about the international platform. Brett, I want to pick it up on, on um, something we, we just mentioned, which is where Canada stands on the international playing field yeah. um, and how better we should be positioned. What, what would you want to see the current government do, to be fair? Well, well, we're watching right now, again, we've already talked about it, but Russia invading Ukraine and what that means to Europe, because they are a prime supplier, Russia is, of fossil fuels, hydrocarbons which is necessary for everyday life, whether you're driving, heating, building, constructing, melting, growing, you know, hydrocarbons are a critical part of that. And yet we as a country are not energy self-sufficient. Why? Because we import a third of the oil that we consume. We export some oil for sure. We could export a lot more, but first things first, we should be energy self-sufficient because of the risks associated with the global markets. And we're seeing it right now, real time in terms of Russia and Europe and the war that they're effectively getting into. So we, should, we shouldn't be bringing oil down the St. Lawrence, we should be shipping it up the St. Lawrence. We should have pipelines and we should be energy self-sufficient. And uh, that means expanding the platform out of our oil sands, expanding the oil and gas industry that we have. We are not participating in the global LNG market, the LPG, liquefied propane, liquefied natural gas. And those are ways that we as a country could be contributing to reducing emissions on a global basis and certainly increasing the, call it the, the ethical component of the oil. Because we're currently buying oil from countries that have no respect for women, children, or the environment. Mm -hmm. And we're spending $20 billion a year to other countries as a return of capital, a return on capital, operating costs. And those are countries that, as I said, don't give a damn about the rights of women and children and the environment. It and, and we, Brett, we, have the, we have the oil here, we just don't have the pipelines. We just don't have the ability to ship it. And we've had the yeah. anti-pipeline movement. We've had a, you know, there was a premier in Quebec, it doesn't matter the name, but he said, we don't do no pipelines. We don't do no pipelines. You consume crude oil and everything that results from crude oil, whether it's the heat that's used to make carb or um, uh, concrete, cement, and therefore construction, asphalt, um, the cars that are driven, this, the hypocrisy of saying that we plan to shift to a net zero market in 10 years, five years, makes no sense. There's no economic model. There's also no technology model that allows that to happen. And yet politicians promulgate that stupidity every time they get to the microphone. So my hope is that we get a businessman or woman, let's be clear on that, um, yeah. to a leadership role in the in the governments that uh, are going to be running our country we need someone with business experience not political experience at winning the day but the business experience at running a country and you know just to pick up uh, in terms of um you know the lack of investment the underinvestment in the energy sector um really around the world well not all areas of the world but you know many and uh, the vilification of the energy industry um, you're, you're seeing the impact also play out in the United States. And I wonder how you view that and how quickly they can turn the light switch on and ramp up production. I'm quite heavily invested in the Northern United States in terms of um, a play, a heavy or an oil play that requires two mile long horizontal wells. And those wells have been rendered uneconomic with $40, $50 oil, but they're compelling at $100 oil. So let's be clear that the, the US oil and gas industry is reinvesting in itself, reinventing itself to some degree. Um, you know, three, four years ago, the, the United States became energy self-sufficient. 
and the stupidity of Biden when he said, I don't want TMX, or pardon me, uh, Keystone XL coming across the border. And then a year later, less than a year later, he's pleading with the Middle East to increase their allocation of oil to the United States. The United States could, should, and must defend its own energy self-sufficiency, but what better name, what better partner for supplying crude oil than Canada? And that's where it just, it's, it's absolute nuts that we can't have Keystone back on the table. The pipelines that are being built around the world and across the United States, um, inside the United States, um, are highly economic and make sense. But this one little cross-border issue um, compromised energy self-sufficiency, energy security. Both of those words matter. And, you know, for example, if any one of the Middle Eastern countries decided to stop shipping oil to the West and only ship to their friends at the Ukraine, uh, pardon me, in Russia or China, you know, energy self-sufficiency, energy security is at risk. And we're not yeah. thinking about that when all we do is allow the energy, call it the eco-terrorists to, uh, you know, the David Suzuki's of the world to terrorize our country. And yeah, we, we've, we've transferred the energy file the national security file overseas. Very much. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Brett, with all of your business experience, market experience, investment banking experience, um, I, I want to get your kind of one or two liner in terms of how you see the market playing out and the economy playing out. Well, energy prices are going to stay robust for some time. And then energy prices means higher crude oil costs, higher natural gas costs, and an output is it's a higher cost of transportation, a higher cost of shipping, and you know, call it the supply chain management, a higher cost for electricity. And so all of those are benefits to the many businesses that are running in Canada and globally. Um, the party that's, that's adversely impacted is the everyday consumer. You know, the single mom who's got two kids and trying to buy groceries and still drive to work because there's no other way of getting there. And uh, the hypocrisy of the carbon tax adding cost to everyone in a punitive way doesn't make a lot of sense. Can I live with a carbon tax at some point? Yes. Should it escalate and triple as the, uh, as the liberals are planning? No. And so real estate is going to benefit. Practical operating businesses will benefit. Inflation works in favor of equity. But at the same time, we don't want it undermining by overextending the costs. And my particular concern, as I said, is with the everyday consumer. It's the, I can afford to pay any amount for natural gas and carbon. You know, the carbon tax doesn't affect me at all in terms right. of my consumption patterns. But it does affect people in their everyday lives. And that bothers me because now we're starting to, again, jump on with, there's going to be caps on electricity prices and there's going to be rebates on natural gas prices. And some of this stuff makes no sense in a world where we're adding carbon tax. Do you, do you think though, but Brett, Brett, do you think though that given the scenario that we're seeing right now, do you think that we will see the Bank of Canada raise rates a few times this year, same with the Fed? And, or if they do, do you fear stagflation? <sighs> I think we're a long way from stagflation, but I think, and going back to your first point, I believe there will be escalation in interest rates just to slow down. As I shared with you in the earlier, earlier session, I mean, our year over year cost increase to our food in a restaurant, it's up 25%. Again, so this idea that we're only suffering 5% inflation, that's not true. And if our food costs are up 25, there's a lot of people who are up a lot more than three to five. We're seeing you know, the cost of a piece of meat is doubled. I mean, there's stuff that it just, again, hypocrisy to think that mm -hmm. that isn't affecting the everyday consumer. So stagflation, I don't think that that's not around the corner because we're not even close to controlling inflation. And will there be some uh, interest rate adjustments? Yeah, there will. I mean, I'm locking interest rates now on a bunch of projects because uh, I see them I see them rising. And we're seeing it yeah. in the forward market. You know, it, you know money's going to cost more. It's that simple. What, what's one of your favorite investments right now? I'm still buying energy stocks. You know, the, um, the, the prize is large. And so I'm still mm -hmm. buying energy stocks. I'm investing in real estate across the West. Alberta and Saskatchewan is, uh, I own a lot of land. And that land has turned, in the most cases, it's turned into something pretty interesting. Kelowna is a hotbed of activity in Canada. And I happened to stumble into that market 15 years ago. 
Uh, farmland in Saskatchewan is still a core business for us. I'm not growing it. I'm not shrinking it, though. That's for mm -hmm. sure. That's probably a, a forever asset in terms of my family and I. Um, so I'm still Crypto? investing. I'm still, I want to ask. Believe. You, you were early in cannabis. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Are oh, yeah. you in crypto? I feel like cannabis is kind of, kind of in the past right now. I mean, I know you're still involved, but did you get into yeah, we, crypto? We had a lot of investments in cannabis and a lot of it did very well. So the, the portfolio did well. There's a lot of stories that are suffering right now and uh, across the plot. Um, crypto, no. I made a few investments in, um, in cryptocurrencies at the blockchain level. And none of those worked out. And again, that was just hmm. exper experimenting to see what was going on. Um, I happen to believe that Bitcoin and all the others are speculation, not a lot, not a lot different than diamonds. And it's a contrived market based on artificial demand. There's nothing fundamental underpinning the value. And so you see the people talk about how much money they've made in, made in Bitcoin. Well, look at the volatility in it. And if you buy high and yeah. sell low, that's called losing money. In Bitcoin, <laughs> nobody admits to having lost money. They only talk about how much they've made. And we're seeing it on social media and platforms where people, I get pestered on Instagram to buy in, to buy Bitcoin through Instagram accounts. Oh, and, wow. And but, the, but, the hypocrisy yeah, is stupid. stupid. You can lose, it's not you an can, investment. You can, yeah, but you can uh, sell low and, and, and buy high in the equity markets as well. Brett, That's I hope you're wrong on the crypto front. <laughs> personally speaking okay be but, careful. I, but i appreciate your brilliant views Brett. we gotta leave it there great to see you thank you look forward to another